Hello everyone, my name is Vincent Lostanlen and today I'll be presenting an interactive human-animal-robot approach to distance sampling in bioacoustics. This is a joint work across two labs from CNRS, both divisions of Nantes University, the Digital Sciences Lab, LS2N, and the Ecology Lab, LETG. We are joined by two interns from Ecole Navale, namely Pierrick Arnaud and Marc Dugardin. The motivation behind our project resides in a fundamental question in bioacoustics, to count the number of acoustic events in a natural habitat. In our case, the acoustic events of interest will be bird songs and bird calls. The problem is that different species of birds have different vocal capabilities, so it would be wrong to assume that all of them could be heard at the same distance. Therefore, surveying the site and counting vocalizations on a per species basis would be biased by variations in detection radius, which is unknown. Against this problem, our project offers a typical VHAR methodology. To begin with, birdsong is primarily a form of animal to animal communication. In comparison, listening surveys are a case of vocal interaction from animal to human. Furthermore, Recent years have seen a surge of passive acoustic monitoring for environmental bioacoustics, and this constitutes a case of interaction from animal to robot. But it doesn't stop there. The key idea behind our project consists in replacing genuine bird vocalizations by automat automatic playbacks via portable loudspeakers. And the appeal behind working with a loudspeaker instead of a living animal is that we have full control upon the location and content of the source material. We have scraped Xeno Canto and the Macaulay Library for instances of audio vocalizations for six species of interest. In doing so, we have restricted our search to near field recordings and applied a high pass filter for denoising. We have also carefully distinguished bird songs from bird calls. And this yields a total of 12 audio files, um, two per species, each lasting between one and two minutes. In order to faithfully reproduce the vocal capabilities of each species, we have searched the bioacoustics literature for precise measurements of sound pressure level. And in this regard, this 1979 paper by Brackenbury is a useful reference because it gives the SPL at one meter for 18 species of birds. Our study site is the Briere Natural Reserve, located some 70 kilometers west of Nantes. This reserve is near the estuary of the Loire River and also near the Atlantic Ocean. The only, way to, the only way to access the site is by flatboat along the canals of the reserve, and the site has no buildings nor roads over a radius of about two kilometers, and the closest city of Saint-Nazaire is about 10 kilometers away. As a result, the site has very little human-caused noise, except for occasional planes passing. However, we hear the continuous sound of the wind blowing in the reeds, as well as stridulating insects. Here's all the electronic equipment we carried with us. Uh, six autonomous recording units, song meter four, which are considered the industry standard in wildlife bioacoustics. One playback speaker with Bluetooth connectivity, uh, in our case, a JBL Extreme, which is waterproof and can emit up to 90 decibel of sound pressure level, and a class A sound level meter to calibrate the loudspeaker. Here are two pictures showing the deployment of the speaker on the left and, on, and one of the sensors on the right. Uh, in both cases, we mounted them onto wooden poles, which we planted into the muddy soil of the Briere wetland. We positioned our sensors over a north-south transect perpendicular to the wind. And as shown in this aerial photograph, we placed the loudspeaker at point zero of the transect and then arranged our sensors over a geometric progression, 10 meters, 20 meters, 40 meters, and so forth, up to 320 meters. Uh, the GPS coordinates of these locations align with our um, measurements on the ground, which is expected. Uh, I should note that the topic of distance sampling in bioacoustics is quickly gaining attention. And so here's a list of, uh, of references of related work. Uh, but the novelty of our approach is that we automate both the playback and the detection 
uh, which allows us to easily scale up our study to various species and call types uh, while finally controlling for the influence of propagating medium and recording hardware. In addition to recording audio with sensors, we also listen to the songs and calls emitted from the loudspeaker at various distances. We noted large variations in the detectability of bird calls across species through the dense wetland of Brière. In particular, we were able to hear the Savise warbler at 320 meters, but had to come as close as 10 meters away from the loudspeaker uh, so as to hear the, uh, the call of the Eurasian reed warbler. Then we came back to the lab and launched a state-of-the-art species classifier on the recording audio, namely BirdNet. Uh, BirdNet is an open source deep learning system developed by Stefan Karl and Holger Klink at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. I invite you to visit their website for more details and a live stream demonstration, and thanks to them. In the near field, uh, we find that the true positive rate of bird net varies across species uh, from 0% to the, to the, with the spotted crape completely missed up to 100% with a sav savise warbler completely uh, retrieved. Furthermore, we find that these true positive rates uh, decrease quite sharply with distance and that the slope of decay also changes uh, between species. If we focus on the Eurasian reed warbler, for example, the song of Eurasian reed warbler, we note that the true positive rate approximately undergoes an exponential decay as a function of distance from source to sensor. And we propose to estimate the parameters of this exponential decay by linear regression on the logarithm of the true positive rate. Now, we should remember that uh, in theory, animals are not arranged over the linear transect merely, but over a two dimensional territory. Assuming a uniform spatial distribution and after integrating along azimuths in polar coordinates, we remark that the actual number of vocalizations is expected to uh, grow proportionally with the distance to the sensor. So we need to multiply this linear growth, this linear increase um, with the exponential decay, which we have measured earlier. And so this product, this multiplication produces a gamma distribution. Uh, and this distribution fits the histogram of distances for correctly identified calls, assuming that the sensing point is neither attractive nor repulsive for the animal population under study. Uh, in other words, we assume that animals do completely ignore the presence of the sensor. They don't notice. We repeat the same experiment for all species in our catalog and fit a separate gamma distribution to each species. And then we define the detection radius of bird net for that species as the 95th percentile of the um, associated gamma distribution. And we use the SciPy software toolkit to compute this percentile, which makes it very easy. We are now capable to chart out the detection radius of six different species, both for songs in red and calls in blue. In this scatter plot, we see that there is no discernible correlation between radius and sun pressure level at the source, at least within the range of biologically plausible sun pressure levels that we've tried, um, namely 80 to 90 decibels, give or take. This experiment suggests that geometric spreading is not the only factor undermining the performance or lack of performance of bird net, but that absorption and reverberation likely play a role. Lastly, this scatter plot represents the detection radius of bird net versus that of a trained ornith ornithologist as a listener. And although we notice a weak positive correlation between the two, a positive trend, uh, we stress that both measures of detection radius vary by large factors from one species to another. For the human listening experiment, we know that the songs, so displayed in red here, are detected further away than the calls in blue, even though they are broadcasted at the same sound pressure levels by design. In conclusion, we have simulated animal to human and animal to robot interactions with machine playback. And the benefits of our approach is that it is scalable, realistic if performed in situ as we did and easily controllable. Furthermore, we have modeled the distances of detected events uh, by means of a gamma distribution. This work opens an avenue towards the probabilistic estimation of per species abundance with BirdNet 
cover, covering a two-dimensional territory instead of a sparse collection of points as is traditionally done in an acoustic sensor network. Lastly, we should note that this is still a work in progress. Uh, and perhaps the most pressing open question is the importance of background noise. Uh, while we experimented in a reed wetland, we anticipate that our estimations would depend upon the acoustic environment, take a city park, a mountain range, a forest, and so on. So we plan to replicate our study in a different site in order to evaluate its scope of applicability. Thanks everyone for your attention. <laughs>